Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This is for UFC Vegas 75. This episode of the Dogger Pass Podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass Podcast are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code DOP when making a new account to get a match up to $100 on your first deposit. Um, yeah, there's the housekeeping. And I mean, a, a weekly tradition these days is I've got to do a shoey because I think I've lost. It's got to be like. One of the biggest runs. Now, I've been taking some, like, dog shots on these shoeys, but it's like, got to get off the schneid here, bud. I mean, from a betting perspective last week, I won a small amount of money. Um, I mean, that Dan Ige, if you extend round uh, round two, about 10 seconds, I get Dan Ige by knockout, and we're having, we're having multiple drinks. We're having celebratory drinks this week on the show. But, uh, you know, a deal's a deal. Cody, Cody Satic's on the line. Megan's on the sticks. That's the other housekeeping I forgot. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll suck this down, Cody. Uh, how'd your week go? Well, yeah, not great. See, I'm a oh, turncoat God. piece of crap, no. and I bet against Team Canada for the most part. I figured they would go three and three. They end up going six and zero, oh, and so that was like a big fault. My own countrymen go against my own people, and for the first time in a long time on Canadian soil, Team Canada actually showed up and mopped up. So. Could have been uh, a lot better. Could have been worse. At least the top ticket did hit. Amanda Nunez cruised <clears throat> right across the board. And then, as you mentioned, Dan Ige got the jump against Nan Landwehr. So not a perfect week, but at least the top ticket didn't burn up in flame. So I don't have the most things to complain about. But, yeah, I did consider, Paul. I was like, from now on, I should literally only bet the shoey bets that I have with Paul because those seem to be just racking up the victories. It's the full card parlays that are struggling ever so slightly. But I need a new sh- <laughs> I need a win so I can get a new shoey boot because that thing was an absolute mess. I know you can't see. We usually don't share the video feed with Cody because internet problems. Mm. Um, but, but I just, my, my shirt's a mess. My shirt's a mess. We have 14 fights. Hopefully it dries up by the time we get through all of this. So we got Marv Vittori taking on Jared Cannonier. Minus, one, minus 115 for Vittori. Minus 105. For Jared Cannonier, who you got, Code? Yeah, so I'm a Marvin Vittori kind of guy, and initially when they announced the fight, I kind of feel like I gravitate naturally towards Marvin Vittori. He's definitely a generous, a generalist, but he's an elite generalist. He can wrestle quite well. He's got outstanding cardio, outstanding chin. Striking, I wouldn't say is outstanding by no stretch, but good serviceable striking and a willingness to engage. Again, he knows he's durable. He knows he's got good cardio, so he's willing to put up volume, willing to put up pace. Uh, footwork, not great, but because there's that constant pressure moving his opponents backwards, it's taxing on them. Jared Cannonier is just heavily muscled, and so when I always think about him in five-round fights, it's he's either going to be super hesitant and just wait on his power shots, which is not going to be a good game plan against Marvin Vittori, who's going to rack up the numbers, or he's going to try to go tit for tat with them. And if he tries to go tit for tat with them, he's going to tire out because you just can't be that built and throw down that hard. But but really, none of that stuff is actually the case. And you got to look at their last fights in particular for the best idea of what we might run into here. And that's Jerry Kinnanier just fought exactly that and Sean Strickland. Sean Strickland is a big, tough, durable volume guy. Brought the volume to him huge. And over the course of five rounds, you see Jerry Kinnanier time and time again answer the call, man. Now, it's a close fight. And a lot of people thought that Sean Strickland won. But you can't take away from the fact that Jared Cannonier lands 141 significant strikes, fights for five rounds, uh, fights well into the fight. Um, I mean, I think he proved a lot of doubters, including myself, wrong in the fact that, yeah, it doesn't matter how built he is. The guy conserves himself well. He can throw down and he can go five rounds. Vittori, meanwhile, all that stuff I said about him still stands true. But in his last fight against Roman Deletes, this is a fight he should walk right over the guy. If he wants takedowns, they'll be available. If he wants to strike, he's just simply the better striker. Deletes is very stiff and robotic and also a guy not known for having great cardio. But man, Marvin Vittori gets bopped up. Here you talk about a lot of people thought Cannonier lost his last fight. Well, a lot of people thought Vittori lost his last fight to Roman Deletes. And a lot of it is him, you know, this 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 constant, I'm going to meet you in the center of the cage and throw down type game plan. Well, guys are going to plan around it. And these tough guys like Roman Deletes are like, you know what? Pfft, I'll meet you in the center of the cage and throw down and not backpedal. And Jared Cannonier is one of those guys, I think. So in terms of volume, I mean, we just seen that he's capable of keeping pace, keeping up volume, keep, capable of going 25 minutes. And with Vittori, yeah, his wrestling's not good enough to take Cannonier down, I don't think. 
His wrestling's not really his primary game plan either. So he's probably just going to be throwing out volume, you know, going to be a good fight. Probably goes later into the fight, if not the full five rounds. And it's up to the judges to what they like. The slightly more volume probably from Vittori or the heavier, more significant shots from Cannoneer. So, I don't know. It's a, it's a main event I'm not putting on the top take. It's a main event you can see going either way. It's a main event you should probably just bet live because it'll get a much better read on what's going on. But pre-flop, I think I'm going to go with Cannoneer. Yeah, it's a tough one. I think the, the line is priced properly. There was plus 130s, plus 140s on Cannoneer. The markets have shortened, and I think it's pretty sharp. Um, the, the only issue, the only gripe I, I would say that like I had with what you said, I think Marvin Vittori can take him down, but I don't think he can hold him down and maintain position when he does, or when he does take him down. I don't hate over two takedowns. Great, great. Uh, you know, he's got a great beard path of least resistance in theory would be to take down Jared Cannon here for Marvin Vittori. Great cardio, great durability, probably goes the full five uh full five rounds but i don't love it and I, he won't necessarily come out and do it so it's like not even i won't even be necessarily adding that on prize picks maybe like if i do like a five leg or a six leg or that'll be like the last one in um i'm with you i am leaning towards J jared cannon here just on landing the more damaging strikes over the course of 25 minutes but anything could happen uh, between these two and I am not going to be stunned let's move on to a fight which is a polar opposite of that we got the biggest favorite on the card Armin Sarukian taking on Joaquin Silva uh Sarukian minus 1,000 favorite Joaquin Silva can be had for plus 700 I mean this is kind of a it's a massive step down in competition for Armin who's been fighting some of the division's elite and looking solid doing it um i don't what, what, what i mean you're a matchmaker like this just seems like a, a like all right you know get armin another win and then we can throw him in the tank against another top five probably a lot of the guys in the top five top ten aren't signing the dotted line to fight armin right now you know they're looking for other guys that are a little bit less difficult fights um this fight makes no sense armin sarukian of course is the pick the question becomes like how quickly does he get the job done here the only i mean joaquin silva seems pretty knockout or bust in this matchup and even like armin could take him down and make it easier on himself but it's like we've seen this guy on the feet he's an absolute stud he, he can totally win this fight at any range that he chooses so um He's a justifiable, massive favorite in this, but what are you supposed to do with a minus 1,000? Yeah, well, that's exactly it. And you mentioned the matchmaker thing, and you actually nailed it. So what happens a lot of times in these situations is Armin Sarukian is an absolute beast. And when you look at the guys that are ranked above him, none of these guys get anything from a fight with him, right? He's massively talented. He's super tough. He's capable of going out there and grappling with the best guys in the game. And his striking's coming a long way. He's 26 years old. He's only getting better. He's gone five rounds before. He's coming off a win over Demir Ishmagulov, the other guy that nobody else wanted to fight because it does them no good. Nobody knows who this guy is. On a hardcore level, yes, of course, we all know who he is. On a casual fan basis, I think he just gets lost in the shuffle. We'll talk about a guy in the very next fight named Armen, not Arman. It, it just gets lost to the casual fan. So I, I don't think a lot of these top contenders are looking to, to sign the dotted line. So as a matchmaker, you have a guy that you need to keep busy. He's 26. He needs to stay active. You need him adding to this highlight reel so that people do figure out who he is eventually by sheer nature of just wins and highlights, right? Uh, what do you do? Now, there's always this Joachim Silva out there on the other side of the spectrum who's just tough and is just willing to take the fight. And for him, it, it, it's banger bust, sure, but he's coming off a win. He probably just got his contract extended. He's 34 years old. He's got absolutely nothing to lose. He's a 10 to 1 underdog. And the one thing the guy does got, if anything, is boy, oh boy, can he ever bang. So, like, if he was going to win a fight by a banana peel, you know, methods, yeah, maybe he just clips him with something early. Chances are he's going to get taken down, ragdoll, TKO'd sometime in the second, probably even maybe submitted sometime in the second. But at least he's a banger with the capability of maybe surviving the first round or at the very least maybe clipping him with something on the way out. So, again, as a matchmaker, you need those guys that are going to step up and take a terrible fight for them. That most guys would be like, no way I'm taking that. But in this case, he's got nothing to lose. And for Sarukian, actually props to him as well. He's got nothing to gain. 
So what he goes out and beats this guy? He's supposed to. He's a 10 to 1 favorite. You'd have him on the top ticket, no doubt, but like he doesn't add anything at all. So like, what do you even do with it? So as you're saying, well, when does he get it done? And I would think in the second round. He's not necessarily like, I need to kill you in the first round as much as he's got that traditional Russian style where he's going to grind on you and lean on you and just break you down. And guys that are elite, well, they can survive that. But guys that are lesser, like... uh like, oh, Joachim Silva, he probably gets down and beaten up. He got taken down five times versus Reza Madaddy back in the day, who's a good wrestler for the record, and then three times by Jared Gordon in their fight before he eventually did clip him and knock him out. So, like, he's live and he's dangerous, but his takedown defense is not necessarily elite, and at 34 years old, it ain't getting any better. At 26 years old, Armin Sarukin's going to make significant improvements every time out, and he's already good enough to win this fight. So, 10 to 1, yeah, he's going to win. But uh, how does he do it? I'm thinking second-round TKO. Second round TKO. What is the price on that? I mean, him in second round was only plus 300. I mean, he's a minus 1,000 favorite, so that's how they come come about these numbers. And it's early in the you week. Chase so a it's prop. Like, you You definitely got to chase a prop here. Or just don't bet. I, I mean, I probably just won't bet this fight at all because that's just not how I roll. Um, I don't really see much of an edge uh, to be had, to be perfectly honest. But... I'm a sick pup who likes really, really long, uh, long, long props and stuff like that. So, is it working? Sometimes. Last week we we came out ahead. It could have been such a good week. I should stop. Start thinking forward. Let's start thinking forward to Christian Duncan taking on Armin Petrosian, minus one fifty five. Christian Duncan plus one thirty five for Armin Petrosian. Who you got here? Yeah, I'll take a flyer on the underdog. First and foremost, Duncan could actually be legit and prove me wrong. He kind of did in his debut where I attempted to fade him, and it's not any fault of his own, but unfortunately, Dusko just gets himself injured. You didn't really get to see the fight get going. Mm -hmm. But uh, prior to that, and the limited that you did see in that, but prior to that, his run on the European scene for Cage Warriors, the guy is like an athletic specimen. He moves very, very well. It seems like he would be an elite level striker. But similar to these Michael Venom pages are guys that, again, they dictate range very well. They're very quick footed. They're, they're in and out. And they're hard to get a read on. Uh, you don't know how they're going to deal with someone that's just going to bring the pressure and hurt them and get to them and cause them to fight off their back foot and cause them to get uncomfortable. So for the most part, he's been dominating, guys. He's had a couple uh, spots of adversity. This Dijon Milan fight, it shows his grappling is really not all that good. So if there was a plan B that some you know tough, stout wrestler would take him down and beat him, he might be in jeopardy. But in terms of giving him strikers, yeah, it's going to allow him to do his thing. We just don't know what the ceiling is for him quite yet. It looks like it could be very, very high. It could be one of these prospects that it's like, oh, we're a little too high up on him. And that's why I'm going to fade him in the spot. I just feel like people are a little too high up on him. When I look at Armin Petrosian, well, he's just been begging for somebody to want to strike with him. And I remember I faded him on his contender series fight, silly me. Because if you look at tape on him, he's an elite level striker, Paul. But he cannot wrestle. He cannot wrestle at all. And he takes on this... Kalilyan Kolev, who's a this Bulgarian boy who's big, thick, and a power wrestler. And he gives up three takedowns like almost immediately. But as soon as he would get taken down, he would immediately scramble back up to his feet. He would immediately just keep the action moving. He'd get up and just bombard him. We're talking three, four, five punch combinations. We're talking six punch combinations. He's not someone who's looking to pick and choose his shots. He's looking to just absolute world win you. And again, he's got confidence in his chin. He's got confidence in his cardio. He's just got bad takedown defense. Anyways, he ends up overwhelming Kolev, boots him in the head, knocks him out at the tail end of the first round. Good win for him. His win over Gregory Rodriguez. I believe you and I had a shoey bet on that one. We did. Uh, close fight. It honestly could have gone either way. Like, I, I see points for Gregory Rodriguez winning that. But Gregory Rodriguez would take him down and maul him and take his back and put it on him. And the kid just keeps working. And when he stands up... He just, he's ferocious. He lands 127 significant strikes in that fight over Gregory Rodriguez. Did outstrike him 127 to 61. It's the control time and the takedowns why it was a little bit closer. But again, volumes there, cardio's there, pace is there. We know his grappling is not great. Not, I wouldn't even say not great, just takedown defense is not good. His ability to get back up and withstand stuff seems all right. Anyways, not all right. Kyle Barahao is someone that you would put in like a, a smothering grappler category. He's not opportunistic. He's not necessarily looking to scramble and create some excitement. He's looking to just shut you down. So, of course, he gives up four. That's a terrible matchup for him because he's going to give up takedowns, which he did, four of them. And he's going to get out, out grappled and controlled, which he did and loses the fight. AJ Dobson, his very next fight, that's his last one, attempts to do the same thing, scores three takedowns. But 
unless you can do it for 15 full minutes, he's going to get back up and he's going to put a pace on you. The interesting thing to me here in this fight with Duncan is Duncan's not likely going to shoot a takedown with him. So what I have is an elite level in Dunk, uh, an elite level striker in Duncan who moves extremely well, will be faster than uh, Petrosian, will definitely have like that range and that reach and that ability to move in and out. But I know Petrosian loves to attack. He loves to come forward. He's going to back him up, hopefully tax his cardio because I know Petrosian can go three full, um, uh, three full rounds hard. Don't necessarily know if Duncan can at that level, right? Second fight in the UFC, still some pressure on the guy. So if Petrosian can attack constantly, throw up high volume, cause this guy to fight, cause this guy to rethink, I think he's going to be competitive. And then the last little thing that sways it in his favor, well, one, he's plus money, but second of all is that he loves to attack with the leg kicks. And so for Duncan, who moves so unbelievably well, the way to beat those guys like Raymond Daniels, or we mentioned, you know, Michael Venom Page, is you chop down the leg. And I think Petrosian's an excellent kicker, so... He's going to get walloped a few times and his chin's going to need to hold up. But like, as long as he can and he can get this thing extended into the second or the third, I think he pulls it in his favor. Maybe even a better live betting spot if he can survive the first round but loses the first round. Just keep that pace going. Keep those leg kicks going and get to him. So I'll go with uh, I've got the arm and arm and special this week. Yeah, the sample size for Christian Duncan just so small. And Armin in two of his four three-round fights were, yeah, as you said, He's not getting taken down at will constantly. He's getting like 125, 130 significant strikes. It's tough to beat at uh, at middleweight. So until I see more from Duncan, I'm going to side with you uh, slightly into the underdog here. Um, could be interesting, like looking for some of those, like I don't even see them posted on this site that I'm looking at, but uh, some of those like majority split decision cards. This could be kind of one of those fights where, you know, Christian Duncan lands maybe the more meaningful, impactful shots, mixes in a, a takedown, maybe some wall install. And, you know, the judges that we're working with on a week-to-week -week basis. Oh, yeah, of course. Because, like, course. then by decision, I saw uh, the guy who said what's – I forget his name off the top of my head. I'm so embarrassed. But uh, the guy who set us up with Max Roshkoff, uh, this was his little idea there. And he's running his own content right now. Um, damn, I should actually know this off the top of my head. But uh, he, he actually mentioned this play, and it actually makes a lot of sense because I was like, what's Petrosian by decision? He's like plus 250. It's like Petrosian by split decision is like plus 1250 or something out there. So yeah. if you have yeah. access to something like that, it's probably <laughs> worth a little worth a little sprinkle. Um, I got to figure – I'm going to tee up the next fights and then figure out that name because I'm embarrassed for not knowing it. On the spot, Cody. So we have Pat Sabatini taking on Lucas Almeida. Minus 200 for Pat Sabatini. Plus 170 for Lucas Almeida. Who you got? So I think if you're a value boy, then you're on Team Lucas Almeida here. Like, he's live to put up a hell of a fight. He always gives you his best. He's got some crushing power. And, man, the guy can actually sustain a bit of a pace. I just don't know if I personally can get to the tag. But uh, again, five foot eleven. I think he's like tall and rangy for the division. Debuts on the Contender Series, and he's a big underdog to Daniel Zellhuber, training partner of Max Roshkoff, plus one forty five underdog. Uh, bet against him. <laughs> the first round. Oh my God, Paul Lucas Almeida can bang and wants to bang. Not exactly the most technical guy going, but just very aggressive, very heavy with the right hand. Comes constantly attacking. Comes forward. Um, no way anybody can sustain this pace he's attempting to do in the first round. But you see that sometimes in the contender series. Guys realize, no, you can't just win. I got to get a knockout. I got to get some type of exciting fight because I need to get the contract, not just the win. Uh, vice versa, if you lose and you have an exciting fight, they'll probably call you as an injury replacement a few fights down the road anyways. So might as well just go out and bang for it. He does in the first round, in the second and the third round. Well, he tired out. It was just an unsustainable pace, right? So ends up losing the fight, doesn't get the contract, obviously. Goes back to the regional scene, jungle fight, picks up a quick win, and then ends up taking a short-notice fight in the UFC against Mike Trezano. Now, Trezano could have fought a much better game plan, certainly mixed in some takedowns, like, what the hell are you doing? But, uh, man, Al Almeida came out similarly aggressive, but he was in shape, and he was able to sustain it. And he beats on him for two full rounds before eventually knocking him out minute into the third. So uh, I felt like even at 32, the guy's actually making some improvements. Cardio had improved. Of course, he can bang. And to beat Trezano, a, a guy that had made it to the Ultimate Fighter Finals, um, 
did Trezano win the ultimate? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Mike Trezano was serviceable enough. He's got a mediocre 500 record in the UFC. But to come out and beat a guy with that much experience in your debut on relatively short notice by third round knockout, all good stuff for Almeida. So I think he's going to be dangerous going forward. Now, why he's dangerous against Pat Sabatini is Pat Sabatini might not have much of a chin, right? And to fight a banger who can could presumably last for two or three rounds and, and 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 continuously carry that power throughout, it's going to give him plenty of opportunities to hit the board and score. And that plus money, like, well, why not? So why are we going with Pat Sabatini if we're going with Pat Sabatini, which I feel like I might be. I'm getting roped into the he's a really good wrestler grappler and wrestler grapplers are going to win these types of matchups. I feel like I'm getting roped into that because, again, when you look at his record, him versus Tristan Connolly, just the one takedown. I think he goes for like one for three on takedowns. Not exactly like the best wrestling in that spot. Him versus Jamal Emmers. Jamal Emmers is actually the one that made the mistake, followed him to the ground and ended up getting leg locked. No takedowns in that fight. Him versus Tucker Lutz, who has proven to not have good cardio and not really that good of a wrestler. Scores five against him, scores six against TJ Laramie. TJ Laramie just a kid at the time, not much of a wrestler, not much of a grappler at the time. He's working hella on his jiu-jitsu. Wait until you see that kid come back. But uh, at the time, it's a full-grown man versus a kid just out-wrestling him, out-grappling him. I don't know if he can't, and of course his last fight against Damon Jackson, it kind of ended before it got going, but he just gets sparked like a minute nine into it. Damon Jackson's dad had just died, so he's super super emotional, came at him heavy, but literally the first shot that lands, you see Sabatini immediately is just wide-eyed rocked, and then uh, the follow-up shots are all precise and put him away, but it almost makes you wonder, like, could a guy like Almeida not just come out hot and get a quick start and maybe catch him? But again, for Pat Sabatini, he's changed out on an elite team, BJJ black belt. Wrestling seems solid enough. Like, I feel like Almeida's going to create enough openings that he should get his wrestling going. But he's more of like a, a stalling guy. You know, he, he stalls on you. He kind of like uh, doesn't necessarily finish you right away. And if he does that type of plan here and you are picking him, I think I'm going to end up picking him. It's going to be a butt clencher the whole time, Paul. The whole time you're going to be worried, right? Because Almeida can shut the lights off at any time and you're paying minus 200 on Pat Sabatini to presumably get his wrestling going, get some takedowns and hold on to him for the better part of three rounds. So I don't know that I love it. I really don't. If there was going to be a quote unquote apple pie shitter this week, this one certainly smells funky. Yeah, there's no way I'm laying minus 200 on Pat Sabatini. Mm. Clear, clear dogger pass for me. He's just so one-dimensional, and that grappling is really mm. good, but you pointed out a bunch of situations where it's like, I don't know, like, he's got a really good submission game when he gets it to the mat. He doesn't always have the best, like, takedowns. I'm not, I don't, I've never really been a Pat Sabatini guy, and you lay this type of number in a fight that I think he could be in big trouble as long it, as long as this fight and fights start on the feet, uh, he could be in big trouble. Uh, so, I mean, you know me, I'm a sick pup. Looking at different places right now, there's plus 700 on Almeida by KO in round one because it's like I'd be stunned if he found a submission. So uh, that's probably a prop I'll drop a little sprinkle on. And from earlier, it's stats and stacks podcast at tax underscore N. He's the guy who got uh, Roshkoff, and he's the guy that I stole the Petrosian wins by split decision slash majority decision off of. So... He's been doing a whole bunch of new, like, he's been... That's a sharp play. Good eye. It's a very good eye. Like, considering that it's, like, by decision is plus 250. Like, you're getting an extra 1,000 points on it. On judges being confused, like, sounds like a good idea to In me. The striking so, battle between two different styles? Yeah, 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 100%. Check out his stuff. He's always been good to us. He's been a good, good fan, helped us out, and... Um, he's been, he's been winning a whole bunch recently. So I've been, I've been noticing, even though I don't necessarily spend too much time publicly on Twitter these days. Um, moving on down, we've got Manuel Torres taking on Nicholas Mata. Manuel Torres, a minus 180 favorite. Mata can be had for plus 155. Cody. I like this Manuel Torres kid. Like, I don't know. You know, when you talk about are you buying into hype, I think maybe he's one of the guys I might be buying into some hype for. 28 years old, getting a lot better. And you see there's a whole new wave of these Mexican prospects that are coming in. And they're legit because you and I week in, week out, talk about their durability. But they've got cardio. They've got good boxing. They've got the ability to to scrap. And when you can get them at a decent price, and of course, he is the favorite in the spot, so it's not, not crazy. But... You get them for a decent price, they're always going to fight for your money, right? This isn't boxing where the, someone's getting brought in to lose. This is like you should be here. Even though the UFC needs to float in a guy or two here and there, it's like 
they're still supposed to be here. They're at, at a modicum of, you know, an elite level, right? When I look at Manuel Torres, this kid is a finisher. He wants to be exciting. He wants to put on a, a, an entertaining fight for the crowd. But he's got a lot of ways to win the fight. He's got a decent uh, submission game, nasty striking, good volume, seems pretty durable. Is that his, like, counter submissions is no good, at least in two of his losses, right? You look at his loss to Carlos Calvao Calvao. First round knee bar, minute 23. Again, he's young, probably hasn't seen a whole lot of knee bars in the gym. Gets caught before the fight gets going. His fight prior to that, uh, two fights prior to that, Mahatma Garcia Avalos, heel hook, 59 seconds. Again, hasn't seen a whole lot of lug locks, right? Gets caught in those. Barring that, man, the kid just comes at you. And I think uh, he's he's dangerous. If you're going to put him at an elite level, guys will figure him out. They'll take him down. They'll probably submit him. At that low entry level to the UFC, he's going to do quite well. And so you see him win on the Contender Series against Colton Anglin, you know, nasty right hook. He'd landed like 36 significant strikes three minutes into that first round. So, you know, good pace, putting up nasty volume, solid power beats Colton Anglin. What does that do for you? Ah, maybe not much. But debuts against Frank Camacho, which... Frank's obviously over the hill, Paul. I think you would agree with that statement. But Frank's mm -hmm. been around the block, man. My God, he's got a ten-year, uh, ten-year tenure with the UFC. He's got a couple finished bonuses. He's fought in some decent competition. He is actually a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, and the guy is known as Frank the Tank, Frank the Crank. He can bang it up on the feet. He can bang it out on the ground, which he never chooses to use. But the guy's talented enough, and he's a savvy enough veteran. So. You see the waves of the sport, the younger generations taking over, and Frank's on his way out. And I think he's the same thing. Manuel Torres comes in. He's faster than him. He's beating him to the punch, and uh, he gets the win. So against Nicholas Mata, Nicholas Mata on the regional scene looked pretty solid. His results, when he takes that little bit of a step up at the UFC level, hasn't necessarily been there. He lost a, his win over Joseph Lowry on the Contender Series. I didn't think he looked very good. Low volume. He debuts against Jim Miller as a favorite. You always cash these Jim Miller tickets. Anyways, plus money Jim. His last fight was a free fight, I suppose. But uh, but on plus money Jim, Paul's the king of all kings. And uh, yeah, Jim Miller just flatlines him in the second round. Again, he was low volume. He seemed to spend too much time looking at the target. And then his, even in his win in his last fight against Cameron Van Camp, Van Camp fanned out 0-2. Uh, I think he's doing some bare knuckle boxing now. But um, he's kind of just like gets caught into these striking exchanges with Van Camp. Thankfully, Van Camp's got durability issues. He's able to clip him with one. But against this young kid, I don't know, man. I think if they're going to battle it out, he's going to go behind on the volume. He's going to get tired trying to keep up with them. And eventually he's going to get caught with something. So I I'm going to go with Manuel Torres to get the win, probably by knockout sometime after the over one and a half. I like it. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And the, the, the real question I have for for Manuel Torres is like, man, he puts it on you early and often and he's coming at you. What? So both of his UFC appearances, you know, one was on Contender Series, 34 significant strikes in three minutes and 20 sec 27 seconds, 25 significant strikes against England in like just a little bit over two minutes. Like he is... The question becomes... If he's taking on somebody with great durability and this fight gets extended, do we have a bit of an issue where, I mean, that type of pace, like he's on like 150, 160 significant strike pace. It's like, can he keep that up? That would be my only question, but we've already seen with Mata, the durability, maybe a little bit of a question mark. Um, I believe on prize picks, uh, Manuel Torres's uh, significant strike total is, pull up the board there, Megan. It is 37 and a half. If you think this gets into round two and you got 34 against Frank Frank the Crank in three minutes and 27 seconds, I'm going to say over, but like buyer beware. He could knock him out like in the first exchange. So there's some prize picks plays that I like this week, but I mean, I really, really liked Mike Malott last week. And then... Buddy just runs into a takedown, gets a catch, uh, kick cat caught. Um, those ones were, yeah, he ran right into the clinch and got like belly to belly, like suplexed. No, I don't know if that's the actual technical term. Don't don't kill me in the comments. <laughs> and then the other one, he gets like a catch, a kid, uh, a kick caught, and then gets taken down. He gets the two, and then of course round two, what I kind of foresaw happening in this fight lands like absolutely drops him with a beautiful punch 
and finishes the job with a sub. It's just like it was one of those tilting ones because I would have absolutely printed on prize picks last week if uh, I mean if Fugit didn't. He kind of just, it, it felt, yeah, he definitely fugged it up. Uh, I'll tell you that much, man. Like, he, he kind of just ran into those takedowns. It was very, very tilting. So, maybe I'm a little bit cautious this week, but a lot of these numbers do seem relatively tight. Over 37 and a half is one I like, but, yeah, I don't really necessarily love any any plays this week on prize picks. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you, Torres, as well. If he can keep that pace up for for 15 minutes watch out because he will be a big time problem uh we got muslim salikov taking on nicholas dalby salikov a minus 190 favorite dalby can be had four plus 160 cody yeah well I, I, this isn't i'm having a tough time getting a read on like again i think it's a fight that both guys could win it just depends like what version is going to show up with muslim salikov he's got some crazy ability that He's super low volume, but he must hit like an absolute tank because either he folds you up or if he doesn't fold you up, these guys aren't willing to exchange with him for the most part. They don't really don't want to exchange with him. And so he turns aggressive strikers into counter strikers because they don't want to lead the dance and get hit by him. And it becomes a lull of a fight. And he's got a crazy ability of doing it because, listen, he's in his mid to late 30s now. If he's lying about his age, I'm not so sure. But the Kung Fu King is a pure counter puncher. So he's not going to do anything until you do something first, and then he's going to counter off of you. If you choose not to do anything, he might land one small singular strike, and the judges seem to like it. He fought Zales uh, uh, Lizu Zaleski de Santos, who everybody knows to be a crazy man, a wild man, a guy that's going to come at you and fight a hard 15 minutes. He's been in wars in the UFC, and he strikes him like 46 to 40. Like, de Santos did not want to engage him. He ends up winning a split decision over him, close contentious fight. But still, it was like, well... How come I've never seen anybody do that to DeSantos before? But it's like, ah, maybe the guy hits hard. Maybe they were wise to it. Maybe they fought a weird game plan. His fight with Francisco Trinaldo, who's a low-volume guy for the most part, too. If you watch that fight, Trinaldo does not want to do anything because he realizes Salikov's a lot bigger than him, hits a lot harder than him. And Trinaldo, who's the most durable guy in the UFC's history, right, uh, actually did clean knock down, not knockout, because there's a reason he's the most legendary durable guy in the UFC. Um he, he he did get knocked down by Salikov, and again, he's just like super hesitant to engage with him. Jing Liang Li, well, he didn't give a crap because that's how he fights. He just came forward, clubbed him, took him down in the first round, eventually knocks him down, and then uh, puts him away in the second round. If you're going to put pace on him, if you're going to come forward, if you're going to bite down on your gum shield, and you could take the damage coming back at you. That, yeah, again, he's in his mid to late 30s. His takedown defense is not all that good. His cardio is not all that good, and he's super low volume. There's ways to beat him. You just got to choose to uh, take those ways. And so his last fight, Andre Fialo, who is an all-action come-forward striker, chooses not to engage him and landed 17 significant strikes before getting knocked out in the third round. Salikov, for his part, had landed 56. So that's about the range that he's going to be at. Now, Dalby, Dalby's wrestling is really not all that good. He's got two takedowns in his last six fights, which spans like, I don't know, four years. So even though he can grapple, and he is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, He's more of like a lean on you and like cage control kind of guy. Maybe clinch up on you. He's not really landing a whole lot of clean takedowns in there. So if I can't rely on him to take Salikov down, then he's got to just go pure volume. Come at this guy pure volume. And then, again, in a lot of his fights, you see him do that. In his last fight, for example, against Worley Alves, he lands 119 significant strikes, which is amazing. But you have no respect for Worley Alves because he's tired and he doesn't hit all that hard. Well, once he gets tired, he certainly doesn't hit all that hard. Solikov, you're not going to try to do that, I don't think, because he hits. And so I go back to certain fights. Dolby against Daniel Rodriguez. He freezes up. He won that fight, actually, but he got outstruck 83-50. to 50. His fight with Claudio Silva, he was getting taken down. That one's not fair to say, I guess. Um, his fight with Jesse Ronson, it's overturned to a no contest, but he gets knocked down hard and then gets taken his back taken, rear naked choked. Durability is not great. Volume is good in some fights. Other fights, he's a little lackadaisical. And it plays in a Salikov's hand to have a guy be aggressive and come forward and try to throw. So I guess I'm going to lean towards Salikov to just land the better strikes. And if it goes to decision, hopefully he freezes up Dolby and the judges side with him. And if not, maybe he walks him into something and knocks him out. But uh, this is a close, greasy fight. I don't think you want a whole lot of exposure here on either side. And it will be lower down on the list because I just don't have a whole lot of confidence. I think both guys can win. It's priced pretty, pretty evenly. But I'm going to go with Muslim Salikov. 
I like Salakov, and I actually like Salakov by knockout. Um, haven't bet it yet, but considering betting it, just yeah, it's like Dalby's been knocked down by the likes of Jesse Ronson, obviously. But I mean, Ronson was on on the gear for that fight. Um, got suspended afterwards, but earlier on in his career, Peter Sabato was able to knock him down. Zach Cummings was able to knock him down. Darren Till knocked him down. The Al uh, Morley Alves fight, I mean, that was not a split decision. Like Dalby won that fight very, very cleanly. Yeah. Um, just a terrible, terrible scorecard to give Warley Alves two out of three rounds there. That's just the nature of the beast. But it's like I haven't really well, that's seen. That's why you're betting Armin Petrosian at plus twelve fifty because these are the scenarios that exist. I was, there. I was on betting the, anyways. Might as well take the punt. I was on the under in the Warley Alves versus Dalby fight, and it's just like I was pretty frustrated watching. You know, Dalby's just so pitter patter. Um, really, like, yeah, the the strikes are kind of. It's it's kind of a shock, like, kind of looking at those strike totals because, like, he wasn't landing anything with any sort of substance. It's like, Warley Alves, if you put on a pace on him, I still think that he would absolutely gas out, fall off a cliff, and you're, you'd be able to finish him. But, like, Dalby couldn't finish a sandwich. Um, I think if he does that pitter-patter stuff with Sal Cobb, and you kind of illuminated is like... I think a lot of the times his strike totals aren't very high because, yeah, people are definitely minding their P's and Q's. They've seen all of the spinning techniques and all the other ways that this guy can knock you, knock you out. Um, if Dalby wants to play that pitter-patter game, and that's how he's going to have to win this game is with a whole bunch of volume, he's going to be standing mm -hmm. clear in the pathway of eating some big shots, and we've seen him get knocked down. I see the best number out there. It's like it just doesn't get me too, too excited, but maybe I'll get to it. I'll probably end up getting to it, but uh, I see a plus 240 out there, which I was hoping would be a little bit higher, to be perfectly honest. Maybe I'll wait until, like, more books open up, but Salikov by knockout, uh, my official pick, and probably a small bet because I really don't think there's that much meat on the bone at that price, but that's how I see this fight shaking out. We got your boy, Rowney Barcelos, taking on Miles Johns, minus 215 for Barcelos, plus 185 for Miles Johns. Cody, who you got? Yeah, I want to think they're giving Rowney Barcellos a favor fight. Uh, he's 36 years old, but yeah, he's done everything the UFC's asked for him. And they give him, you know, regular competition. He looks like an absolute stud. And the guys, I always mention it, you know, he's like a seven-time member of the Brazilian national wrestling team. High-level Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Tight boxing skills. Defensively, you know, yeah, not the most sound. Could move his head a little bit more. But yeah, he's got good footwork. He works the body. He's got good jab. He's got technical skills, world-class skills right across the board. He was a little bit older when he signed to the UFC. And then right from the get-go, they gave him some soft fights. He fought Kurt Holubo, which actually he got dropped in that fight. Didn't look great, but came back and won it all the same. Chris Gutierrez, unranked. Carlos Huatian, well, he did not last very long in the UFC. Beat Saeed Nurmagomedov in a really close fight. That one aged extremely well. But then from that, they go right back to Kali Taha, like should have been going up. And he took the Timor Valia fight, the dangerous fight, because Timor Valia was unranked. Nobody had heard of him, but he's actually super talented. That's another fight that I was heavy on Barcelos. Barcelos could have won that fight. He knocked him down twice. He had him dead to rights in the second round. I have no idea how it wasn't a 10-8. Makes no sense to anybody scoring a fight logically how it's not a 10-8 round. Draw should be my worst case scenario. But in the third round, dude, he took his foot right off the gas. I don't know if he was tired. I don't know if he was ages catching up with him. It was a pretty good fight. Timor Valio just kept coming. Should have been a draw. Anyways, it seemed like in the third round, he kind of fatigued when it was like, this is your moment to show that you're world-class. World-class guys tend to step up when it needs to be done. He didn't quite get there. His fight over Victor Henry, I'm big on him. He gets crushed as a massive favorite. Again, it wasn't like he had a willingness to engage. He tried to, but Victor Henry just danced circles around him. Made his elite style a primitive style by just causing him to chase constantly, moving around the perimeter, and just outstriking him, throwing up sickening volume. Victor Henry landed 181 significant strikes. Mostly pitter-patter, just like you're talking about in the breakdown of the last fight. Um, but all the same, just like cleanly outworked him. So I think the UFC says, you know what? We're going to give you a, a favor fight. They give him Trevin Jones. He looked good. He looked good to me. I thought his striking looked good. I thought his wrestling looked good. Two takedowns. He doesn't usually use his wrestling a whole lot. He opted to use it there. Um, looked like a good version of him. But the reward for winning a fight and being back 
is a fight with Umar Nurmagomedov. And so unlike Saeed, Umar actually related to Khabib. And uh, yeah, Umar's the real deal. So like he gets caught, he gets knocked out. What's troubling for me in, in that is that I think Rowney Barcelos beats Miles Johns absolutely everywhere. But like he's not been knocked out and he's coming off a nasty knockout loss. So like how much does that take out of a guy? How much does that change things, right? Uh, at 36, big knockout loss. Uh, if it, I don't know. It's just like, is he damaged goods? Is he slowing down? Is he gonna, is he gonna give me a poor effort? But that's why I think it's a good comeback fight for him. And the UFC is giving him a bit of a favor here is that Miles John just doesn't really seem to be able to get over in any one spot. He is explosive and he doesn't have some decent power. So if for whatever reason, Rowney is done, Miles John is capable of catching him with something, but he comes in with a wrestling background, wrestled in college, comes to the UFC, and his wrestling has been largely ineffective as far as I'm concerned. He's not able to get the takedowns against these guys with you know decent enough take. It just hasn't translated for him. That big explosive power, meanwhile, he just doesn't set it up enough. He throws like one-twos, one-twos, one-twos. I think guys eventually see it coming, and they figure him out. Uh, the John Cassidy not a fight. Just John catches him clean, puts him down, was out working him. Solid victory. Outside of that, all of his wins, Vince Morales, decent enough win, I suppose. But he landed, he got outstruck 39 to 38 over the course of 15 minutes. Won the fight on a unanimous decision. Got one takedown over Vince Morales. But one takedown and 38 significant strikes. That ain't going to cut it against Rowney Barcellos. That's not going to cut it with anybody in the top 15. So... Yeah, I would just, I don't think it's enough. His other wins, Anderson Dos Santos, currently cut from the UFC. Kevin Atividad, cut from the UFC. Cole Smith, cut from the UFC. In contender series, he beat Richie Santiago. That fight with Richie Santiago, for the record, he gassed out and didn't look very good at it. So, Miles John's one of these very explosive, um, you know, athletic type fighters that just ha has trouble putting it all together and and really becoming a, a rounded mixed martial artist. Rowney, he's pretty well rounded, man. He's got skills everywhere and he knows how to put it together. There's just that little bit of hesitancy of like where he's at, where's his mind at. But skill wise, I think he wins this fight. So Barcellus, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm going to be betting him. I mean, he took he he probably looked a career best against Trevor and Jones. Looked amazing. And then he gets Umar. So great. He's been very inconsistent. It's been tough knowing fight to fight. We've seen him rocked a whole bunch of times. Miles Johns landing a big bomb is definitely on the pit table in this matchup. And that's going to keep me away from a minus 215. But I'm going to pick Rowney with you. I mean, he took on Cousin Umar. And like it was, there wasn't much going on on the feet there. And then all of a sudden he was dead. But he's taking on Cousin Umar, the future king of 135 pounds. So. You know, give him a, give him a pass on that. Um, I'm picking Rowney as well, but very very hesitantly, and uh, I am a little bit worried that uh, I I just think he just when he does punch, he uses his. They're both the same reach, like it's 67 inches to 66, so he's got a one inch reach advantage, which is pretty insignificant. But the way that they throw punches, it's like Rowney throws you know longer longer punches longer longer range weapons and uh i feel like miles johns is a little bit more of uh you know winging hooks that type of guy so Rowney should be able to fight at range and keep himself out of trouble he's got the wrestling to keep the fight upright i think it's a pretty hard matchup for miles johns outside of landing a big bomb, which is obviously, as we've already said, very much on the table. We move on. We've got Alessandro Costa taking on Jimmy the Brick Flick. Costa, a minus 255 favorite. Flick can be had for plus 215. Flick came in last time off of a massive layoff. I caught, like, it was over, what, the, the, the Christmas holidays, I believe. So it was like there was like a month off in between fights. Caught an awesome number on Flick against Charles Johnson. And my God, my God, it, it went bad to worse, like pretty much immediately from the opening bell. Um, the cardio, the, the problem with him is that cardio at 125 pounds is so incredibly important. It's like all of these guys can go a hard 15 minutes and if you can't go a hard 15 minutes like you're gonna get absolutely pounded in this sport um maybe you know it was coming back after a long layoff but now what that fight was back in yeah i mean it was enough there's been what five full months in between fights maybe went back back to the uh drawing board and and got things back in order 
But it's going to be hard for me to pull the trigger. I mean, plus 215 is slightly tested, or is, a, is slightly uh, tempting. Costa, obviously we saw him against Amir Albazi, incredibly tough matchup, and he held himself pretty well up until that third round. Like, didn't look completely out of pace against one of the best guys in the division at this point. Um, I... I you know me I I will never lay a minus two fifty five with so many question marks around a guy like Alexander Co or Alessandro Costa, but I guess he'll be my pick. I just don't know if I can get back to to Jimmy until I see it uh, in action. What about you? Yeah, I've always had trouble getting behind Jimmy Flick just because I've watched this guy's pretty much entirety of his career. I've attempted to book him a few times, and I never thought at any point that he was an elite level talent. By any stretch of the imagination, right? He's very much a journeyman. He's a hardworking guy, full-time job. Tell, tell him the brick sent you. Shows up. Nasty submission game. Nasty submission game. The reason why I never thought he was an elite-level talent is he cannot take a punch. He's got no durability. Of his six pro losses, he's been knocked out in five of them. Of those five knockout losses, Paul, he got knocked out Will Camposano 26 seconds into the second round, right? So the round literally starts, he gets folded over. Uh, Le Levi Moles, minute 27 of the second round. Chris Gutierrez, who's not a power puncher, pretty much has not knocked out anybody. More of a light kick guy, if anything. Yeah, he knocks him out, right? Ray Rodriguez, Ray Rodriguez, big underdog, 15 seconds into the second round. And then, of course, his last loss, Charles Johnson, 433 to the first round. So, like, not only does he get knocked out, it's, it's usually in the first round, like, very early into the second round. So I've always thought he's problematic. His boxing's no good. Does not move his chin, does, doesn't move his head. Has no footwork. He's just scrappy. And when you fight at a regional scene level, you can get takedowns and you can submit guys. His cardio is not that good, like you said, for a flyweight. And so he doesn't only have one massive problem at 125 pounds. He's actually got two, right? One, you got to fight 15 minutes. Like you said, everybody at 125 pounds has got cardio. So if you don't got cardio at 125, you're in trouble. Second of all is durability. Everybody at 125 lands about 60, 70, 80 significant strikes per fight. There's a lot of scrambles. There's a lot of motions. There's a lot of, of movement. There's a lot of striking. And if you can't take anywhere between 20 or 30 of those significant strikes, you're going to topple over. Can't keep pace. Can't get take the damage. It makes him problematic. Now, anyways, he comes eventually. The UFC says, well, he's coming up a win over Greg Fisher. It was a nice regional show win. So they give him a fight on Dana White's contender series against Nate Smith. Nate Smith, 6-0 at the time, and was like a pretty solid wrestler, right? Greco-Roman, inexperienced. And Flick puts on a clinic, man. It was the most submission attempts in Dana White Contender Series history. Eventually submits him in the third round. Took him down at will. But Nate Smith blows his knee out early in the first round. Flick proceeds to try to submit him like 20 times. Eventually gets him in the third. And whatever, they give him the contract. He takes on Cody Durden as a big underdog, and he hits him with the flying triangle choke. And then he just quits. He's like, oh, yeah, I want a UFC fight. That's all I ever wanted. There's no money in this game. I'm done. Peace out. And decides he's writing a book. I got him on Facebook. Trust me. I've been following this guy's entire career. Uh, he's writing a book. And then the book thing doesn't really last. And UFC cards, and then that doesn't really last. And then you realize that you don't actually like your nine to five desk job. It wasn't a desk job. He's like, you know, a uh, tradesman. So he's making money, but you don't actually love it. You love to fight. So he took like two and a half years off and then just decides, you know what? I'm back. Shows up. Dad's in his corner because he's like, I might as well celebrate, spend these times with, you know, family. Like, I think he's taking a half seriously and then gets absolutely molly walked by Charles Johnson. Now, for the record, Jimmy Flick's really only path to victory in any fight is trying to get the fight to the ground and submitting a guy. Charles Johnson perhaps has the worst takedown defense by the numbers of anybody at 125 pounds. In fact, he's given up 14 takedowns since the Jimmy Flick fight, and that's two fights in four-month period of time. So to get one on Charles Johnson, not hold him down, not be able to get him down the second time, and then get knocked out at the end of the first round, all bad news. He'll have a better camp this time. He'll be in better shape this time. But all the same issues that he's had that have plagued him throughout the majority of his career, they're all going to still be here. So we know what we're getting out of Flick, which is, you know, we always say like knockout or bust, like he's sub or bust. He needs to like pull guard. He's not going to pull guard. He's actually like scrappy with his wrestling. He's tenacious. He'll grab onto a leg like a dog on a bone and try to jerk you to the ground. But he seems to be very one dimensional. Now with Alejandro Costa, we don't know a ton, but here's one thing worth noting. Amir al -Bazi went one for four on takedowns against Costa and largely could not take him down. Mm -hmm. So 
if Amir al is struggling to take him down, Jimmy Flick is not taking him down. And Costa is also actually a decent grappler. I think he's a high-level grappler. I think he could probably stuff a lot of these submission attempts to begin with, but he doesn't need to even try to grapple. He needs to just stuff the takedown and then bop him up standing, and I think he will do that. So uh, I, I will take Costa. But of course, with uh, anytime you're betting against a Jimmy Flick or a you know a, a one-dimensional power puncher guy, like there's always that there's always that aura of like they could snatch up something. The kid could throw up a flying triangle choke. He has done it. He has pulled a rabbit out of a hat. But like you're not betting on that stuff to happen regularly, I don't think. And Flick with his history, his durability issues, he's a little bit older now. One foot in, one foot out. Uh, if he doesn't get this fight to the ground, it's not going to be good for him. So not only will I take Costa, but if Flick takes Costa down in the first round and Costa can just survive, and Flick tries to submit him, I don't care, try to stick him with a few submission attempts, but does not stick him with a submission attempt, round ends, I'm live betting Costa because I don't think he's going to continuously take him down and I don't think his cardio is going to hold up as we talked about. So I'll be looking at it live betting as well, but even pre-flop, I'm just going to go ahead and take Alessandro Costa. Makes sense. All right, make make this one, this next one makes sense to me. We've got Christian Canones taking on uh, Mr. Perfect, Kyung Ho Kang. Minus 165 for Canones, plus 140 for Kang. I mean, they originally, and sometimes like what they open the line at is, it's nonsense because like that number is gone within seconds. But like, I'm kind of stunned by this one, Cody. Like, Kyung Ho Kang has been in the division for such a long time, fighting some of the best guys. They opened it at minus 180 on his side. It was immediately steamed up to plus 160, and it's ever so slightly been, so it's obviously was. Uh, like softer limits and stuff like that um, at that that opening number I guess but it's slowly kind of working its way back right now um I think it's like plus 138 at the book that I took so it's moved two points since I made this this odd sheet but I, I mean tell me about Christian Canones here because like I don't really quite understand it's see everything I kind of look at kind of points towards Kang um and he's the underdog um, make, yeah, make this I'm one actually, make this one yeah. make sense to me, Cody. Yeah, well, I'm actually going to agree with you in that I, I think Kang at plus 140, plus 138, plus money it is the pick. But Kang, and I've always maintained this, Kang's got some legitimate skills, man. He can wrestle. He's got decent cardio at times. He can strike. He's got a long jab. He seems like a you know a good fighter. He's got no ring IQ, Paul. Zero ring IQ. He makes the stupidest <laughs> mistakes time in and time out. Take the guy down. Doesn't take the guy down. Don't take the guy down. Takes the guy down. Always had these problems that have just constantly plagued him. So I think he's 35 years old now as well. And he had a two and a half year layoff from the sport because of a Korean military service. So I don't know that he ever like got to his peak. And then now at 35, I don't know that he's going to get to that peak. So... On one hand, I've got a 35-year-old Kim that's gonna, or sorry, Kang that's gonna make a lot of mistakes, and I don't, you don't never know where he's at. Kinones, meanwhile, I think feel like the reason why he's taken some action, he's the, the favorite status is again, he's he's another one of these wave of Mexican prospects, young, 27 years old, seems like he's got some decent durability, seems like he's got good cardio, seems like he can bang it out, and if he's gonna fight Kim for 15 minutes, because I don't think he's putting Kim away, but if he fights him for 15 minutes. Maybe this is his opportunity to show up and show out. But yeah, I'm going to agree with you, dude. Kang actually has volume. He can, He's capable of landing 100 significant strikes. He can carry that through. And he's got the wrestling edge. So, like, I think he can win the striking exchanges versus Christian Quinones on the feet. But then it's the mixing in the one or two takedowns near the tail end of the round. Like, just be smart. Be smart and use a little ring IQ here. Use a little, little, a little cage savvy. You are a long-tenured man of the UFC. Use it. Use that veteranship. Now, will he? No idea. But for plus 140, I'm willing to take a chance. So I'm going to agree with you. I'll take Mr. Perfect to uh, spring the upset. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm just kind of, I was just kind of stunned that like the market moved all the way up there. Maybe by the time we get to fight time, this is closer to a pick. I'm not going to be stunned if he loses. But, um, but yeah, he's, he's pretty, he's got skills in literally every aspect of the game. He's been around this for so damn long at this point he's been in there with literally every single style you could possibly ask for 
I just was wondering it's if I was fight, three fights in four years. Like, yeah. I mean, Canona is it's not like what he hasn't lost in a while. He's obviously young, um, but he's got some like KO losses, submission losses. Like, man, his fight with, on the Contender Series versus uh, Zhao Long was very competitive. Razor, it was actually quite a razor, good fight, man. Razor close. So, so I don't really a big jump up in competition. I don't understand the the massive steam there. So I'll be back in the the veteran with you. All right, moving on down, we've got uh, Denise or Dennis Bondar taking on. Carl Carlos Hernandez, minus 130 for Bondar, plus 110 for Hernandez. Who you got? Yeah, so this is another one I'm actually going to go with the underdog and take uh, Carlos Hernandez. But but could it be greasy? Almost certainly. And could I lose? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully not almost certainly. But it's going to be a close fight. It's You're going more with a narrative than anything else. And so we'll start off with Carlos Hernandez because, of course, he's going to be the pick. I, He's a very kind of like a Marvin Vittori. The first fight we broke down is that he's he's a generalist. It's not like there's anything he's doing wrong. So he's not exactly doing a whole lot of stuff super advanced. The guy can strike. He's a good striker. He's a decent enough offensive wrestler. Take down defense. We're going to talk about that. Not so good. Um, I just don't see him getting over that hump of fighting the elite level competition. And so when he fought versus Daniel Baez on the contender series, Baez, banger. They should have signed that guy too. But a banger from Spain, not really known for his grappling at that time anyways. And he scores the five easy takedowns. And then you've seen in his uh, fight against Victor Altamirano, he had given up one there, but still Altamirano, not a, a great wrestler, I suppose. And then in his last fight, again, he's, he's in a no-win situation against Alan Nascimento. But... Uh, yeah, he gives up two takedowns, the second of which he ends up giving up his back. He gets rear naked choked in the first round. I want to give him a pass because Alan Nascimento is a badass, an absolute badass, a very, very good fighter, right? So I give him the pass there. But if you're giving up takedowns in all of your fights, you're going to either fall behind on the scorecards or someone with good grappling is eventually just going to catch you with something. So like, it's not necessarily the best way to be fighting. Now, comes out of a good fight, that Valley... Um, Valley team over in uh, Illinois. He's moved around the area in the Midwest a little bit, gotten some good rounds in. At 29, I still consider him a prospect, you know, eight and two, but he needs to step up. He needs to step up. He needs to go out there and he needs to get a significant victory. And when I see him fight, he seems to flow from technique to technique quite well. His striking's pretty good. I thought he looked real good in the Victor Altamirano fight. It's the, there's a difference. There's levels to the sport. And is he going to be able to jump up beyond that? Dennis Bondar, though. What's there to suggest that Dennis Bondar is that next level jump up? Because again, here's a guy with a super padded record as far as I'm concerned. He had fought his, his prof he, if you look at his amateur uh, record, right, it's five and zero, oh, and that debuts in 2017. But if you look at his pro career, he was seven and one or six and one by 2017. So here's a guy that fights almost ha half a dozen pro fights, then goes back into an amateur competition, ends up winning that, then comes back pro three and three, 12 and 10, Four and three, zero oh and two. You know you're eleven and three, but you're fighting a guy that's zero oh and two. Even the guys like this, Kelvin Jacques, seven and one, not good, not good. Kanin Jafari, eighteen and twelve, not good. None of these guys are good. And so when he debuts against Malcolm Gordon, shame on me. I thought, well, maybe he, there's just nobody for him to fight, and he's actually good. He just hasn't had the chance to fight good guys, and so he comes in as a. Minus 280 favorite over Malcolm Gordon and proceeds to get trucked. Now, I mean, he looked nervous. His striking was not good. His wrestling is not good. And he ends up getting his arm broken in like a pretty crazy transition from Malcolm Gordon, who more or less toyed with the guy. That causes him to take 16 months off because of a broken arm. And now he is a betting favorite in his sophomore outing in the UFC. I can't get behind it, Paul. I can't get behind it. I can't find one. Now, listen, when you watch that regional show tape, the guy's a grinding machine, wrestling heavy, wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. He's aggressive. He's in your face. He's wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. That's why he's the favorite. People are looking at it as, well, one guy is big on this wrestling and aggressive, and Carlos Hernandez really can't wrestle all that well. His takedown defense is his kryptonite. So I see it. I see it. And how am I going to lose this fight? Probably that Bondar comes in shape and his wrestling is good, right? That's how I will lose this fight. But I'm willing to wager at that plus money that Bondar is not really a good wrestler. His wrestling looked good against bad guys, but he's no Daniel Baez. He certainly ain't no Alan Nascimento. And if he does not get the takedowns going, his striking's non-existent. He'll get pieced up. So, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to take Carlos Hernandez, slight plus money. You know, on prize picks, Cody, they have Bondar, two takedowns. 
I would take the over on that, but I think Carlos gets you back up and over. makes some work and takes oh, him out. Okay. Well, yeah, I think so. I don't right, know. So that, I don't know. That's a, non, that's a no play, then, if you're going to be taking overs there. I know uh, the problem I'll is... Tell you why. My question with it, I was, I was like... Is, is does this Bondar guy even really wrestle all that much? Like, is his wrestling good on the regional scene? Like, I he's don't fighting know. cans, so it's hard to say, right? And it's like, oh man, this but, guy's yeah. a real good grappler because he's he's got ten submission wins. But if there's ten Brazilian Jiu Jitsu white belts, but you can never submit a blue belt, are you a good grappler? Like, no. again, there's got to be levels to it. Whenever you see these kids show up, he's he's sixteen and four. Was his, sorry, he's sixteen and three. Is his pro MMA record? coming to the UFC and it had spanned five years. So he picked up 20 fights in five years, 16 of them wins over mostly guys with winning records, but just winning records. It, it's it's a red flag. And that's why shame on me. I didn't buy into it. I thought, oh, Jim Malcolm Gordon's not really all that good. I, I went against Team Canada again. I really got to stop doing that, I guess. But uh, Bondar looked way out of place. The reason why I said the over two takedowns is you're getting a flyweight fight here, okay? And so we talked about this earlier, flyweight, lots of action. lots. It's a flyweight fight where one guy's presumably going to try to wrestle and the other guy on average gives up more than two takedowns per fight. It's the how what's considered a takedown. Oh, he caught a kick. He That's drove true. him to the ground. Oh, all of a sudden, Carlos Hernandez pops back up. But it is a takedown. Oh, Carlos Hernandez is throwing a combination. He gets a little overzealous. Oh, Bondar reactionary takedown. There's your two takedowns. So, so because it's flyweight and I expect a lot of action, that's what probably would lead me to believe the over. But so three I'm takedowns. still going to go with Carlos Hernandez. Oh, it's three. Well, it's mm. two, you would need at least two to break, like to to break even. I think the line's set well, and there's probably no play there. Is what I'm kind of gleaning from that. And that's a no play. Yeah, I think they 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 nailed it. Because yeah, the problem is Carlos Hernandez's takedown defense has been exploited literally in every single fight. So um, that was my biggest question about Bondar, and it sounds like I'm just kind of avoiding. Uh, moving on down, we got Zalgus. We got pimblet haired Zalgus, I believe. We'll see him during uh, during fight week, taking on Felipe Bunes. Minus one fifty five for Zalgus Jumagulov, plus one thirty five for Felipe Bunes. For love of God, like I would, some there's this one guy out there who does like profitability index. I think his like names like Monk Matician or something. I see it pop up on my feed from time to time. And um, poor Zalgus is like way down the list, but it's just like if he actually won the decisions that he got robbed on, he'd probably be one of the more profitable guys on this card. But it's like judges. Absolutely hate him. Hence why he's got the Patty Pimblet hair now, which is a hilarious little gimmick that he's that he's rolling with. Um, is this the spot where Zalgis gets gets a W? The guy's just been criminally um, just screwed by the judges time and time and time again. Now he is always in pretty close fights, but like there's been multiple fights where it's like, yeah, it was close, but Zalgis should have got the nod. And he just never gets them. It, it, it goes against him every single time. Is Bunez gonna, you know, bring in more of the doom and despair for for Zalgis Zumagulov here? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna say that's a no. Not gonna bring the pain. But again, it's Zalgis, so you gotta rely on the judges and what the judges think. And I think he's won all, the vast majority of his losses. I think are wins outside of the Albazi fight. I thought he beat Roly and Pava, who he outstruck sixty six to fifty two. And he took him down twice. I thought he beat Manel, or not Manel Cop. Uh, I thought he beat Jeff Molina, who he did get outstruck against, but the two takedowns. And then I thought he beat Charles Johnson. 119 significant strikes landed, plus a takedown. But you can't take away from the fact that he's losing these fights because he, he looks really good in the first round. He looks really good for the part of the second round. He starts to fade out. Everyone's scoring the first two rounds for him. But the second rounds are always getting a lot greaser than need be. And then the third rounds, he's tired. He, I think he's a fighter that's, you know, fought an elite level. He's fought in some heavy, heavy rounds. He fights a heavy, heavy style. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's just his cardio is not quite there anymore or if it never was to begin with. Like, he used to fight like a maniac on the Russian regional scene. But now that Usada's is involved, like, I'm not accusing him of anything. It's just he doesn't really seem like he's got that hard three-round cardio. And again, 125 pounds. You kind of need to. So wins the first round easy. And not only is he getting raw, but like if you live bet against the guy, you'd be making a ton of money because everyone thinks he's winning. Live bet's always good. And you're almost assured that after that first round where he looks really good, 
you may be able to get a, a better price on him. Jeff Molina, it's not a robbery. Jeff Molina won the fight. People disagreed, but it was a hell of a fight. It was a hell of a fight. The fight with Charles Johnson, dude, Charles Johnson landed 115 significant strikes, right? It's a, they're close fights. They're subjective fights. I think Zalgus won. You think Zalgus won, but you can't leave it at the hands of the judges. And at 125 pounds, most fights are going into the hands of the judges. It's just the bottom line. So what does Zalgus need to do to win this particular fight? Well, Bunez, Bunez is, this is like, I, I don't know. I would think it not, I don't want to say like it's a bucket list thing for him because he legitimately won the LFA 125 pound title. But um, I, I don't, I, he's 33 years old. He had gone on a losing streak on the Russian regional scene, fought Mansur Kadyev, Murad Magomedov, Imran Bukayev, all by decision. Guy's durable. Guy's got some decent grappling. His striking is mostly just one-two. Got some decent power in his right hand, but uh, not like he's going to tie combinations together. Not like he's going to throw up any massive volume. He's got some decent grappling. He's got a win over uh, our boy Yoni Sherbatov with a flying triangle arm bar back in the day. The guy can definitely grapple. But beyond that one big explosive maneuver, he seems to just get outworked. And Zalgis, for all of his faults and him slowing down, the only reason he's slowing down is because he works. Now, Jeff Molina's got excellent cardio and excellent volume. Charles Johnson, terrible takedown defense, but excellent cardio, excellent volume. Those guys were able to work alongside him. Bunez, I don't think, I don't think he's going to keep up. His 1-2, one, 1-2, two, one, two, one, two is going to pale in comparison to Zalgis who throws combinations. He comes forward and he throws punching combinations, right? And then Zalgis could most definitely mix in a couple takedowns here and there to persuade the judges, which I think he will. So Bunez is live, not only because he's fighting Zalgis and he just needs to get to a decision to maybe scrape by a debatable one, but because, yeah, the guy's actually got some decent powers. Last fight with Yuma Horiguchi, dropped him multiple times before putting him away. And again, he's got a, a volatile submission game. But you've seen him against this tough, stoic, Eastern European, Russian mold. Guys that can take his punch. Guys that are going to back him up, be aggressive, and mix in takedowns. And, like, he hasn't really excelled against those guys. Zalgus is kind of one of those guys. And you're getting a good price on him because he's got a, a sketchy history of losing fights that he should have won. So, yeah, I, I would I would take Zalgus. But, like, am I expecting Zalgus to get the rub that he deserves? Yeah, maybe because of the haircut, you know. Now that he's a fan favorite, the judges definitely take that into consideration, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I added them to some, like, Bellator parlays, but it's like, I don't want to get too burned on Zalgis and how the judges just kind of hate him. Um, and I will add that, like, Je the Molina fight that you were mentioning, it's just like, even Jeff Molina thought he lost that fight. I mean, he lost that fight for the boys in the Discord, sources say, allegedly. So, um, that, that you know, that's my greasy theory on that matter. But uh, that's neither here nor there. We've moved long past... The uh, the Kraus Kraus gate at this point it feels like but uh, I don't know man the Kraus gate just like never seems to go away every time I think it's over and done with there's like a new saga like at this point uh, it seems like the list of victims that he's people he's I don't know, I'm not even getting into it man I'm just gonna slander myself let's just move on let's move on we got Teresa Teresa Bleda taking on Gabriela New uh, Fernandez my bad. Uh, minus 250 for Bleda, plus 205 for Fernandez. I mean, Bleda had a pretty tough uh, debut in the in the UFC, like her official first UFC fight. Like, it is absolutely looking like Natalia Silva is the real deal. Now, obviously, Natalia Silva was minus 1,000 last time out, but it's like this girl can kind of do everything. And Bleda put her in, this, like, gave her some problems early in round one. It's like she's very, very strong able to hold her up against the cage and it's just like once she wasn't able to continue doing that obviously she just got absolutely folded in round three from a spinning spinning back kick but um but uh you kind of know what her game plan is she's gonna back you up against the fence she's gonna press you up there she's gonna take you down she's gonna bully you from top position is that going to be a problem cody against Gabri uh, gabriella fernandez like, is there a massive, like, grappling ability here? Um, or is this, should this be one way, one way work for Teresa Bleda to have, like, an easy, this would be kind of more like her debut fight in the UFC. 
Yeah, well, so I, I see the path of victory for her. I'm going to pick her. I think she gets the win. But I think if you ran it through Pat Mayo's model of plus money underdogs and the old WMMA, this is a bad price tag for Teresa mm -hmm. Blada because simply she, she's got the style to win the fight, but she's 21 years old. She's super green. She's got zero striking. It's a bad spot. Take it from a guy who bet Miranda Maverick last week at a stupid price. And then and she had all the pre-fight advantages, right? Then the fight starts and she had zero advantages. Her, zero. her cardio wasn't as good. Her strength wasn't as good. Her striking wasn't as good. Her wrestling wasn't as good. She had zero ability to get up off the ground. It was a complete wash. Man. So arguably, like, she had no pre-fight advantages zero that's how misleading this shit is sometimes <laughs> so so when i look at Teresa blade yeah she's got these advantages but the price just seems off the reason why i i am going to pick her still because i'm an idiot of course is uh again there's something that you can like there she goes undefeated as an amateur like eight and no but if you look at her amateur record right she fights lucy pudilova in an amateur exhibition fight pudilova uh, the blada is 18 at the time 18 and a half Pudi Lova had just been released from the UFC. Is currently back in the UFC. She fought her when she was 18 years old in an exhibition fight against a seasoned pro fighter who was in the UFC, and she wins by decision because she's extremely strong. She forces her way into the clinch, and then she tosses you around. Goes undefeated as an amateur, goes undefeated as a pro, gets on the contender, the contender series against Na uh, Nayara Maya, and the fight is awful. It is a terrible fight. She only does get one takedown for the record. Scored a knockdown, which was like a greasy, you know, push type punch. And then uh, largely could just control her in the clinch. I thought she looked terrible. But Dana gives her the contract anyways. And you know when he does his little explanation after the episode? He says, uh, I don't know what it is about her. She's just, there's just something about her. Doesn't say the fight's any good. There's just something about her. Well, I'll tell you what's the something about her. She's 21. So she's able to do that, even though it's not super impressive. If you're able to do that already, chances are you're just going to keep getting bigger and better. And, and in her case, she is very physically strong, and I think she's going to make those improvements. So she comes to the UFC, they give her Natalia Silva, terrible fight. But again, she went out there and got a takedown. She went out there and did the best she could. She showed some heart when she was getting hit, and she was getting hit hard. She tried to persevere. It was just a terrible fight for her. But no doubt about it, she can bulldoze her way into the clinch. And when you look at a girl like Gabriela Fernandez, who, yeah, lost to Jasmine Jassa Divisius, so you're going to give her a pass because obviously she's a top 10 girl of the division. But it's it's a similar type matchup in that she started off well against Jasmine. She had the striking advantage, apparently, early against Jasmine. And then Jasmine's ability to not even cut off the cage, but to just come forward, press her up against the cage, basically take away any of that space and get a hold of her. Then after that, find it, causing her to fight off her back foot and initiating the clinches and wearing on her, she scores four takedowns. And then when she does get the takedowns, it's it's pretty pretty easy with the with the ground game. I would think Blada could do something similar. Is she Jasmine Jasmine Vicious? Hell no. But the similar game plan of just wade your way into the clinch, back her up, initiate it, press her up against the cage, cause her to carry your weight, tire her out, score a couple takedowns, win the fight. But at this line, mm -hmm. no, nah, I mean, come on. I just there's not a whole lot of interest there. How could there be? No. Yeah, you're just holding, you're hoping for somebody to muscle them, hold them on for dear life against somebody who was, I mean, facts or facts was the, what, LFA uh, flyweight champion. So she's got skills, obviously. Um, yeah, yeah, you're kind of like, it's a risky, you're hoping the judges score, uh, cage side are, are digging the, the cage control, you know. Uh, lay in prey, which I think was probably the the most reasonable path to victory for Blada here. So risky visit minus two fifty. Um, yeah. Oh, I was gonna complain about something. There's one book, Cody. It's like so they kind of like throttle all of the action that comes in. So it's like we've talked about three fights. And I just like I asked for a little bit. I was surprised it went through because this this book is like so uncool. Um, they're kind of cowards a lot of the times. And it's just like, we talked about three fights since then, and they're still pending whether they're going to accept like the extra little bit I tried to put on Kang. Very uncool. Yeah, very, yeah, yeah. very uncool, Cody. I would, I would, I would suggest that you, you've probably bagged that book a few times. And now they're like, well, oh, we have someone that reviews they it. Never, Trust they, me, I've been there. They they, never, they might, it might pen for an hour. 
they never even let me bag them because everything just gets throttled there. It's very uncool. All right, let's let's talk about something that is cool, which is uh, Ronnie Lawrence taking on Dan Argetta, minus one fifty or minus one eighty for Cody's boy Ronnie Lawrence. Dan Argetta can be had for plus one fifty five. I mean, that was a big eye opener against Said Yukov Kakarmanov for uh, Ronnie Lawrence. It's like he got throttled in the wrestling department. So it's like, this is one of those fights. Cause it's like, I'm kind of tempted by like less than four takedowns on Ronnie Lawrence, which is like absolutely terrifying pre-flop um, on prize picks. Cause like Ronnie Lawrence could go out there and you'll kind of know from like the opening, the opening takedown, opening first couple takedown attempts, if he's going to absolutely soar over this and get up to like nine, 10, 12, I believe he got in one fight. Or if he's really going to struggle in the grappling department. It's one of those fights. It's just like and Dan Argetta's, you know, low center of gravity. Super, super strong. Look at his ears on that graphic, people. That guy knows how to grapple. Like, your ears don't get all that messed up by, you know, by not pulling in the work on the mats. I don't know. I think this is kind of a tough matchup for Ronnie Lawrence. And, like, we've... Argetta hasn't really shown me much in terms of like power punching ability or anything. He's obviously stocky. He's obviously strong, but we have seen with Ronnie Lawrence, um, you know, in the, in the previous fight to that, where it's just like, I was already counting my tickets. Oh, Ronnie Lawrence was such a free, you know, free parlay leg, yada, yada, yada. He gets knocked down in round three, ends up pulling out the victory. You know, he didn't completely go out, but it's like, we've seen the guy rocked a few times. Minus 180, I've really struggled to get to that, Cody. I think we're going to, I feel like, and I know it's a coward's way out. And I'm going to, for, for the purposes of the show, I'm going to pick our get up, but it's like, I feel like you're going to have a much better idea of how this fight really shakes out by like the first couple wrestling exchanges so it's like i'm i'm really targeting this fight from a live betting perspective because pre-flop i really struggle to tell you if dan's able to you know block those takedowns immediately i think it'd be another rough night for ronnie lawrence uh what's your take here bud yeah i mean he might be able to stuff them out pretty uh pretty easy i guess we'll have to see but with ronnie lawrence his first three fights well his contender series fight and then his two ufc fights but we'll put them together as the three ufc fights he had he was 26 and 0 in the takedown department scored 26 takedowns in the three fights taken down zero times now he's 27 and 10 in the takedown department because he went one for 10 in takedowns against saeed kakramanov so yeah i think Part of it's like, was he a great grappler? Was he fighting the Vince Concheros of the world and the Manda Martinez's of the world? And and of course, there's levels to this. But, you know, here's a guy in Ronnie Lawrence that trains down in South Florida. He's with some of the best guys in the sport. He's making a lot of improvements. And he is a really good striker. To me, him mixing in the wrestling was awesome. Because, again, I think the guy's a very talented striker. It's that you don't want to be going out there and, and, and battling every fight standing. You need to be able to mix in takedowns. It's mixed martial arts. If you want career longevity, you got to be able to grapple. So he seemed to be focusing a lot more on his grappling and using his grappling in fights. But, again, the guy has decent enough you know, uh, footwork, moves quite well, has some speed, has a nice straight left down the pipe, um, You know, good clean punches. The man in Martinez fight, he got knocked down twice. But he knocked down Amanda Martinez down three times. And Martinez is a banger. So he can strike. Again, it's that you want to get that wrestling going. Now, Saeed Kakramanov is very much like an Armin Sarukian. But unfortunately, we had a 2-2, two and two, I think, UFC record. They cut him for absolutely no reason. But nobody wants to fight the guy. And is, you know, unlike Armin, who will finish somebody here and there, uh, he wasn't the most exciting guy going. And they don't. nobody wants to fight him. He's just going to go out there and wreck you. So the fact that Kakramonov's quote-unquote caught from the UFC does not mean anything about him. The guy is elite. The guy will go on to another large organization. I think he's a pretty good fighter all around. So we know now that Ronnie Lawrence can't really wrestle at the elite level. Can he strike at the elite level? I guess the Manny Martinez fight shows that he probably shouldn't. It looks like you know his potential, which looked limitless prior, is now starting to uh, maybe get capped off a little bit. But I think this is a good stylistical matchup for him. Dan Argueta, prior to coming to the UFC, had spent his entire career at 135 pounds. He took his debut against Damon Jackson at 145. And even though he gave him a valiant effort and stormed back in the third round and almost won the fight, he did give up the two takedowns against Damon Jackson. He also uh, handedly had lost the first two rounds, and it's very low on the numbers. He landed uh, 27 significant strikes through 15 minutes. So 
Takedown defense, his offense is solid. Takedown defense, not exactly great, but the volume standing was low. And then the Nick Aguilar fight. Nick Aguilar is not really all that good, man. He just got absolutely thrashed by Chase Hooper. But in, in this particular fight against uh, Dan Argueta, he gassed hard in the second round. And it was just one-way traffic. Argueta could take him down. Argueta could lie on him. He could ground and pound him if he wanted. And he outstruck him 47 to 14 over the course of 15 minutes. So the one thing with Ronnie Lawrence is he's got tons of volume. Like, he can strike. Should he be banging it out with the Mano Martinez of the world? No. But can he strike soundly against Dan Argueta? Absolutely. It comes down to the wrestling. And can he stuff more takedowns than not? I think he can. The thing with getting taken down 10 times by Kakramano is he got up nine, right? Like, you could get up. It's as soon as he got up, this guy's just on him again, tossing him to the ground. But Kakramanov is one of the biggest 45ers I've seen in a long time. And Dan Argueta is a 35er moving up. Like, I don't think he'll have the size. I don't think he'll have the physicality. And I think Ronnie would have learned a lot from getting humbled in that manner. So give me Ronnie Lawrence to get back on the winning trail. All right. And finally, we got uh, Modestus Bukakis taking on Zach Pauga. Minus 200 for Bukakis. Plus 170 for Pauga. Who you got? Well, so again, you when you... When you scroll through whatever the website you go to uh mma mania or mma junkie or mma fighting whatever you're scrolling through you're getting your news feed you see a fight you immediately get like a a, a gut reaction in this case Modestus spikaukas is back in the ufc i'm fading him zach pauga hasn't had the greatest run i suppose but uh, he fought on the ultimate fighter at, at a heavyweight he lost to you know uzman's brother um whatever i guess i could give him a bit of a pass it's the Jordan Wright fight that stands out in particular, Paul. No one's ever fought Jordan Wright for 15 minutes, and no one's ever gone 0 for 6 on takedowns against the guy, relied on just pressing him up against the cage the entire time and leaning on him. That's a real low-level win. Banned. And I don't really know where any of his wins have been all that good. He was a 205-er that jumped into the, to, uh, the Ultimate Fighter house, beat a couple heavyweights that obviously should not have been there, lost in the finals, and then just throws up an absolute stinker against Jordan Wright. None of this stuff bodes well for me in particular. I, I wouldn't particularly like it. Modesto Spokaukas, meanwhile, he moves a lot. He moves laterally a lot. He's a long fighter. He's actually got some decent combinations and some decent power. And he's done everything right since getting released from the UFC. So his run, not memorable. Gets knocked out by Jimmy Crute. The Alexei, uh, Mikhail Oleksikchuk uh, Oleksik fight, sorry. Super close. That's actually a really good fight. Gives a good account of himself. And then gets his knee absolutely thrashed off by Khalil Roundtree. It's he went back to the regional scene. He got his Cage Warriors title back. Fourth round TKO. Solid cardio. Hits pretty good. Makes some decent decisions. And then comes back to the UFC and draws Tyson Pedro. Well, in the first round, he gives up two takedowns. He gets out grappled. He loses the first round. Second in the third round, he's still there. And he's still landing. And to me, that's the difference. Is that even when he got taken down... He was able to eventually just make the adjustments, stuff the takedowns in the second and third, and outwork this man. Pauga is going to try the same thing. His wrestling's not all that good, so getting down with Pauga is probably not going to happen. But he could clinch up with him up against the cage and lean on him. That would be the move: lean on him, try to take out some of that that pop. But I think the speed advantage is for Modestus. I think the striking advantage is for Modestus. I think he could TKO him second or the third round. And again, Pauga, if I was going to bet him, which I'm not, but if I was going to bet him. What's his path to victory? Clinch him and hold him up against the cage for 15 minutes? Like, yeah, it's a, an effective way to win fights, but you could need the right set of judges and you need the right set of circumstances and you need the right set of fans. Like, they're booing you the whole time as you're holding on to this guy and he's punching you in the face, even though they're these little, your back's up against the cage, you can't generate any power. Just, just simply outworking him and keeping the fight standing oftentimes is good enough, so... I, the more I think about it, the more I looked at it, the more that I, you know, watch back fights and, and re-remember re them. Um, I just think he's going to outwork them down the stretch. But totally greasy fight. I would not want a whole lot of exposure on. Yeah, I'll side with you. I mean, yeah, I, I think I said to somebody, I don't know if I tweeted it, but I was just like, if you drag Jordan Wright to decision, it's just like, boom, gone. Lose your job. Mm. I don't care if you win that decision. It's just like, that was like one of the more, and I mean, I guess coming off of the loss to Mo Uzman, he just wanted to get a W in the in the column, but it was like, it's a pretty uninspiring performance um, in that victory. Um, I, I was obviously super tilted because I'm sure I had like unders and all that other type of stuff, uh, jammed, jammed some money into that. It was a pretty, it was a very, very, Ugly one. Dragging Jordan Wright to decision is uh, 
you know, should carry some prison time. So out of out of spite, it sounds like you have something to say. Out of spite, I was going to say, uh, I'll, I'll be just picking against Pauga moving forward for yeah, for the rest yeah. of eternity until he proves me otherwise. No, no, I'm on, I'm honestly just going to agree with you. Like if you <laughs> if you look at Zach Pauga because he comes out of the uh, the Ultimate Fighter, he's like, oh, he's a prospect. He's 35 years old, okay, and he turned pro at 32. He was 32 and a half, so he's been fighting pro for three years. And he's in the UFC as a 35-year-old man who would have not been here if not for the fact that he had competed on the Ultimate Fighter. And not as a heavyweight, but there's not enough heavyweights to fill up a season of the Ultimate Fighter, so he gets on, and now he's here. Three years as a pro, he's already 35. Modestus Buskoukas, or Bukoukas, is 29 years old. He's six years younger than him. Mm -hmm. He's got three times the pro experience. He's captured the Cage Warriors title twice. And he actually got released from the UFC. Sorry, he got signed to the UFC and beat Andreas Mikalidis the same year that Pauga turned pro. Like, there's, it's leaps and bounds, right? But uh, I think we, we're we going to need a late stoppage or the judges decide with us. Because if Pauga just clings on to him, and you see it all the time, he may win this fight, he may win his next fight, and then they'll just not renew his contract. Uh, Jared Roshall, he was 6-2 and two in the UFC. Don't renew his contract. You don't want those kind of guys. 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah, he's got a. He's got a. Getting. They gave you. Yeah, they gave you a. Get back on track. F- get a, a exciting finish. You'll get some fans behind you. And it's just like, you mess up the Jordan Wright spot. It's. Who does You're on a very short leash. You are. He is on a very short leash heading into this fight with Modestus Bukakis. Let's be honest. Um, who has since returning to the UFC has looked very very improved. And it's like. One of those losses, what was the Khalil Roundtree, was the, what, the stomp to the knees. Like, that was just a tough spot, right? Or am I thinking to of overcome the- that shows me more, to yeah. be honest, right? To overcome the fact that this guy shredded my knee, and then he goes back to the regional scene, and right off the get-go is like, give me the best European fighters. So he comes off the Khalil Roundtree fight. He beats Lee Chadwick, which is a bit of a tune-up. He beats Chuck Campbell, right, for the title. And then jumps in short notice against Tyson Pedro as a... Plus 190 underdog. Honestly, it was way higher than that. I don't know what topology is saying here, but um, yeah, dude, he rebuilt himself in all that time. Zach Pauga has not done anything in his entire career. He was on the Ultimate Fighter. He won two exhibition fights, lost in the finals, and then held on to Jordan Wright, who has never, never in Jordan Wright's career has he seen the scorecards. Like maybe he has once. I don't think he has. I'm going to double check that fact because it yeah. is a fact, but, and uh, like if- but all the same, you know what I'm saying. If you're paying attention to UFC roster watch right now, we've got contender series coming up this summer. We've got a season of the ultimate fighter with a bunch of seasoned vets that are, you know, chomping at the bit to get back in the UFC. It's just like you are seeing cuts literally every single day. Like it is winter is coming as they would say, people are getting snipped from this roster. It's a massive roster. It seems like every single day, it's just like, Oh, there's a six fight, seven fight veteran. That's, that's, you know, going off somewhere else. Um, Some of them are actually good guys too, but mm-hmm. it's, yeah. Are they getting, are they four and four in the UFC and they're making a little too much money where by the UFC standards, making too much money for 50, 50 results, or are they not entertaining? And for the record, just to that fact check. Yeah. Jordan Wright's got 16 pro fights, no amateur fights, 16 pro fights. And in those 16 fights, he had never been past the second round. He's never seen like the second minute. Cut. Of this, or he's, yeah, he's never been past the third minute of the second round. Never seen a round three. Zach Pelga took him to a round three, and then took him right to a decision. So, yeah, bad news. And then to to your point about the um, all these cuts, nobody's safe, man. At no. first, I was like, oh, that's weird. They cut six guys. Then the next day, it was like they had cut four more. It's like, well, why not just cut them in one round to ten? It's like, geez, cutting ten guys is kind of big number, no? So, well, they did it in two little groups. And then every other week, it's just like another set of them, another set of them. And why is that? Dana White's Contender Series starts up again soon. And I think they were like, Dana, last year you gave away 179 contracts. <laughs> Not a real figure. But every episode, I go to my brother's place and watch it. And we make a little side wager. We go, oh, is it a is it a four Dana contract night? Is it a three Dana contract night? Five Dana, five contract Dana night won almost every single week. It was insane. Everybody got a contract. It was like the Oprah Winfrey show. Everybody got a car. 
It was amazing. Yeah, you used but, to have to uh, get I a finish. They were like, dude, we've got, we contractually obligated to give these guys these fights now. So they're like, okay, well, these guys are going to come in for 10 and 10s. So let's wash out that middle range 26, 24 to 28 range. Let's move them out, bring these 10 and 10s in and they're, and put together fight night cards at the apex because our hardcore fan base doesn't give a crap. They're going to watch it anyways. And uh, in terms of like these network, I don't think they care about ratings as much as just content every week show. That's what the deal is. That's what the contract is. Give me X amount of hours. They fill that. I'm cool with it because I'm a fight fan. You're cool with it because you're a fight fan. But uh, yeah, yeah. They they don't care if they've got a guy that's mid-level or high-level. High-level for their pay-per-views, you need a few of them. For the most of these cards, it's just who's willing to put on an entertaining show and get paid a small sum of money. And unfortunately for a 35-year-old Zach Pauga to hold on and cling on to somebody, and because he was a finalist on The Ultimate Fighter, probably has a better contract than the average guy, yeah, he's going to have to do something. And if he tries to do something... He'll get caught by Bacocus. And if he doesn't try to do something, I'm hoping the judges just get it right for a change, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and thoughts and prayers go out to uh, Braxton Smith and Martin Sano. Gone too fast. Gone far too long. Gone far too early uh, from the UFC. <laughs> there was a couple of them, uh, they, they, those, yeah, those guys Martin got those Sano, guys Martin Sano is the worst guy they've signed in a decade. I don't probably. know. Braxton Smith came in and gassed in about two minutes. Like that was it's very rare that you get one fight in the UFC and then they're just like, oh my God, we made a massive mistake. You're gone. Like usually they'll give you a second chance, but nobody was really uh, stunned by either one of those guys. But like my boy, Ilir Latifi, um, got shown the door. Trevin Jones, Omar Morales, Tony Gravely, uh, Dana Bakari, Maquan Amir Khani. It's like, these are some guys that have been around for a long time and this is just in the last yeah, month like it's a, nobody it's, is that's, safe that's as you said that's the contract said. thing for sure you yeah. look at Macwan Mirakani at 145 pounds right it's like how many guys on the roster does Macwan Mirakani roll up at 145 pounds probably a bunch of them Macwan Mirakani versus Lucas Almeida on this card I'd be into that fight It'd be a good fight there's guys he can beat but because he's been with the UFC for so long he's making up 40 and 40 which mm -hmm. again is not a whole lot of money but it's all business. It's just all financial. It and is. the best thing for the Macwan Amir Khanis of the world is to get cut, easy contract with the PFL. And uh, man, can you imagine these guys are making a million dollars? Like I watch PFL every week, and it's they wouldn't they wouldn't curtain jerk in the UFC. And UFC is not the best guys going. These PFL guys might not win in Bellator, but they can win a million dollars in PFL. It's amazing. Love it. Yeah, Shoeface. Shoeface got a uh, million dollars, and it's just like he was on a four-fight losing streak in the UFC. It's uh, it's crazy out there. Oh, it's the best. I love it. And there's tons of fights. There's, what, PFL. There's Bellator this week, UFC. If you're a fight fan, it's a great week. To, if you're a fight fan, if you're a fight better, this is one of the busiest weeks I can remember in a long time, uh, top to bottom. There's over 40 fights for you to get your degen on so uh good luck this week hope you enjoyed the show for producer megan and cody zaptic i'm paul shaughnessy saying i'll goodbye. hit you with the prp real quick oh, i'll hit you with the prp snap. yeah 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 See, I, know, I messed I know, up the always. outro i messed up the outro last week cody and then now this week i forget to hit the, with the prp people would have been livid if they didn't get their prp Hit him with well, it. I was thinking, I was like, oh, this is a good way to end it. He's going to end the show and then say, but before we leave, Cody, hit him with the PRP. And then I just hit the PRP and that's the end of the show. Roll the graphic. Let's get out of here. But uh, it, Paul's not just hitting a shoey of seltzer. It's a hard seltzer, ladies and gentlemen. So you got to keep not that in hard. consideration. PRP this week, we're going to go with Jared Cannon here, who's technically dog number one. Armin Sarukian, who's most definitely not dog anything. Uh, Armin Petrosian is going to be dog number two. We're going to go with Pat Sabatini. That one could flip. I really don't like it. And I, I actually like that plus 170 on the other side. We're going to go with Manuel Torres. We're going to go with Muslim Salikov, Ronnie Barcelos, Alessandro Costa, Kyung Ho Kang, dog number three, Carlos Hernandez, dog number four, Zalga Zumagulov, uh, Teresa Bleda, Ronnie Lawrence, and Modestus Okaukas. So figuring out the exact order of what we want to go with, uh, still going to need a little bit of work. But like Paul said, there's a PFL and there's a Bellator. And so you can mix, match, and plays. You can pick just exactly what you want. You do not need to bet most of this stuff. But in a perfect world, which it hardly ever is, sometimes is, 
let's crush Friday, Bellator and PFL, and then make all types of wild, stupid decisions on the UFC. Take it day by day. Anyways, uh, Paul's over already rolled out the outro, so throw it back to him. That's it for me. Bye. Oh.